we did most of the symbols. Um, we did that yesterday. Got most of those done. Uh, Kelly Converge. Yeah. You guys want to dive into that? We've done a lot of electrical stuff. Let's dive into Kelly Converge. What else is circuits you want to watch? Uh, map. Map. Yeah, I'm curious about that. Oh, twos, fuel, trim, LT, and ST. Does anybody want to know what that means? Nope. Long term, short term. Um, what else is in there? Uh, let's start off with that. Okay. Um, Kate wanted to know how a cat like converter works, right? <clears throat> I want to know that too. You do? Mm -hmm. Come on, let's get this done, man. Flow is going this way. Can't close it off. Flow is going this way. And here's that little honeycomb substrate stuff. I can't draw a honeycomb, that would take me forever. The honeycomb goody goodies. Okay, we got a little O2 sensor sitting here. A little pigtail on it. O2 sensors here. Pigtail on it. Now, um, So you guys know what fuel, you know what uh, O2 sensor looks like on a scan tool? You kind of do. Basically, an O2 sensor, it's called stoichiometry. 14.7 to 1 air and fuel ratio is where it's at like the metal. Like, but it's very, very narrow band. So 14.8 to 1, it would be low, and 14.6 to 1, it'd be higher. Like it's really, really right there. So what the computer does is it takes it and it wants to see it there, but it, it knows that that's like a super fine line. So it goes and, and it goes, it adjusts the fuel trim up until it comes up. Okay, I got too much fuel, I'm gonna take a little bit away. Go down, up, down, up, down, up, down, all the time. That's the, that's the job of the short term fuel trim. J O V S T F T. Short term fuel trim is to basically force the upstream and this is downstream. Kind of like a river, goes through upstream, downstream, duck, pretty simple. Uh, the job of the short term fuel trim is to force upstream rich and lean. And if it can't make this go up, so I'm just going to draw what it looks like. Let's just let's, let's draw a, a limit here, like this and like this. This is the scan tool. This is zero volts, and this is one volt. On scan tool, this is kind of old school. They kind of got away from this in a little more complicated way later. But so the job of the short term fuel trim is to take it from lean to rich. Oops, I'm too rich. I'm gonna go lean. Oh, I'm too lean. I'm go rich. Too rich. I'm go lean. Lean go rich. Rich for lean. That's literally what it does. And the fuel trim. Let's say this is the fuel trim here. Um, upstream. Let's say this is the fuel trim. STFT, short term fuel trim. Fuel trim is, uh, I'm too rich. Okay, right as it crosses the 450. MV, millivolts on scan tool, 0 0.450, half a volt, basically. Right as it crosses that and it goes this way, up to the top, the fuel trim is trying to make it richer, so it's going richer. And right as it crosses that, it says, oh, I'm gonna, go, I'm gonna go lean again. And so it starts taking fuel away from the base calculation until it goes right here, it's, and it says I'm lean, then it goes back up again, and it drives that rich and lean. So this, the short-term fuel trim, actually drives the long-term. So because it's such a finite number to hit, it just overshoots it every time to hit it at least once? It's never going to be right. Now later on they went where they could measure a large range, it's called wide range air fuel sensor. Okay. Your Toyota has that in that strength. Wide range, it's got like five wires instead of four. These typically have four wires. They have a heater and a circle in the center. Two heater wires is basically like a light bulb. So, does that make sense, anybody? This guy is controlling that. He's making it go rich and lean, rich and lean. Make sense? Somewhat. Okay. The long term fuel trim, LTFD, I'm just putting it like that because that's the way you see it in the scan tool. It might say long term, but. If you have a Ford or something that really abbreviates it, let's say that. The long-term fuel trim, it watches this and it wants to keep this within 
you know, if it sees that this is having to go like this to keep that thing switching, the long-term fuel trim, I really sucked to where I placed that, didn't I? I'm going to make it short. The long-term fuel trim, let's say it's in zero right here. <clears throat> As it sees us do this, its job is to, over a long time, correct and bring this up, and it starts helping the base calculation out, which instead of this going down, it will keep it in the center here. Its job is to keep the short term in the center, close around zero. It's a long term. You won't see it jumping around. It's, it's long term. Okay? Fuel terms are something that once you get them, like they make sense. Boom. Until they throw in lambda. Then they'll throw in lambda at all the other ones. And you learn lambda. So, you're going to see, start seeing lambda. So lambda, 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 whatever you want to call it. I call it lambda. Um, you take whatever number it is, because it's like 0.997 or 1.001, 1.084. You take that number times 14.7 equals your fuel, uh, yeah, times 14.7. So if it's one, basically if it's one, it is running at 14.7, which is stoichiometric, which I think is an awesome word, I don't know why. Stoichiometric, I think it's a cool word. Um, stoichio. Stoichiometric. That's how lambda works, which is basically, lambda replaces short-term fuel term. But instead, anyway, I'm getting really deep. I'm just gonna go back up to some. That makes sense though, a little bit? Yeah, I'm, I'm fascinated by it. I just looked that up. The, the comparator is always thinking about it. We can let Lambda down here. We'll figure that out later. Okay, so this is upstream. This is a normal functioning car. Good O2. Basically, when it's doing this, the computer has control of the fuel. It's in, in, in closed loop. It's looking at this sensor. It's making adjustments with the short term to make that correctly. I call that, it's in, it's in, it has fuel control. It's in closed loop, and it's heated up, it's running good, everything is happy. Caden, do you know what the, the downstream, or you, I know you probably won't know this unless you took a class on it. This is the downstream O2 sensor. 1V and 0V. Do you know what that should be? No. Do you know what that should look like downstream if you have a healthy O2? What this thing here's job is to store oxygen and then when there's extra hydrocarbons, which is fuel, that's unburnt in there, that oxygen, this gets red hot. Like it will glow, like super bright. Not super bright, but like, it'll glow like a, you just heated something up with a torch. Um, that honeycomb glows. So that stores oxygen and anytime a hydrocarbon gets in there, or extra hydrocarbons that aren't burnt, that oxygen with the heat burns them up. Right there, they get really hot. That's kind of why if you have an injector that's pissing up here, but it's not, it's, it's putting the right amount of fuel and the air into here, that thing will get really, really hot because that's burning. That whole cylinder is dumping in here and burning right here. Make sense? So it. Burns. That's really hard on cats when you have a, a uh, ignition misfire. So you have the fuel and you have the air there. That's really hard on cats. That's why they actually flash the lights in the Fords. Turn the injector off, and if you think your injector is causing misfire, it's actually the secondary because the computer shut the injector off. And you think the injector is bad, that's another fun time. But you have to catch it misfire before it shuts the injector off, I know for sure. So it burns the excess fuel? Yeah, it burns any excess fuel that comes out of the engine that's not consumed or burned. Okay. And it stores, its job is to store oxygen. So, what's the O2 sensor measure? What's the O2 sensor measure, you guys know? I do you know of oxygen. Fuel trims. Oxygen. oxygen. It's kind of important to remember the O2 sensor. It's called an oxygen sensor. It senses oxygen. It doesn't sense carbon monoxide. It doesn't sense burnt gas. It senses how much oxygen is in it. Oh, that's telling it how much, okay. There's really cool things you can find out later when you get a little deeper into diagnostics and misfires. You can tell whether it's ignition miss or ignition or a fuel cause miss 
based on what the upstream and downstream do. If you have a lift converter, you can you can actually dis distinguish that. So it senses oxygen. This is how much oxygen is in that pipe, and this is how much oxygen is in that pipe. This is basically, apparently the best way to do this, this would be a, this will make sense I think. This is an air compressor tank. So if our air compressor didn't have a tank back there, and you'd hit the air, air gun over here, it would kick in right away, the pressure would go down, and then it would build it back up and shut off. Go down and build it back up and shut off. Go down, up and down. This is a, basically, think of this as an oxygen tank. You can hit that thing, and what comes out the other end, let's say you're hitting the air gun, tighten this is the wheel, this is the wheel, this is the wheel, this is the lug nut, this is the lug nut, this is the lug nut. Well, on the other end, if you have a big tank or a big oxygen storage, it just goes like this here. Eventually, it gets a little lower, and then this here is going to be ramping up, the average will ramp up, and it'll just kind of keep going like this. Hmm. So it stores oxygen kind of like a tank, if you want to think of it that way. Probably would make it pretty easy. Hmm. So, would that be a good oxygen storage? Would this be storing oxygen good? If the upstream looks like this, here, let's do this. If the upstream sensor looks like this, and the downstream sensor looks like that, would that storage of oxygen be good? Um, Morning, Joel. Um, this is a tank, like the air compressor tank. If I don't have any tank, the downstream is going to look exactly like the upstream. Make sense? Yeah. Morning, Joel. I'm going to say yes. You think that's good? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it is. Um, I had, it was literally just yesterday, I had that journey that came in here, I had a bad upstream O2 sensor, and it had a bad catalytic converter. And it set codes for both of them, it was correct. So, um, a lot of times if, if you have that up there, you're going to get, you're going to get a little bit like this. That's about what you would actually see on a really good converter. Uh, if you have a bad converter, I mean, it'll pretty much... Follow. Like it's going to be almost the same. That makes sense? Because it's not storing oxygen. If it ain't storing oxygen, you can't burn oxygen. You can't burn hydrocarbons. Um, so it's just sending more oxygen through when it needs it to, to burn the fuel a little better. So. Okay. Well, there is some oxygen that comes out the tailpipe on an engine because it's not 100% burning up all the oxygen. So this stores those little extra, it's kind of like a scavenger. It stores the extra oxygen and then any hydrocarbons that come down the pipe here, any little hydrocarbons that come down the pipe, they go here and they go, because they burn up. It, it burns them up. And then they come out here, it's just like, you know, there's no more hydrocarbons. There shouldn't be if it's storing oxygen good. So how did I test that, even though I had a bad upstream oxygen sensor on that car yesterday, how did I test the... Actually, do you guys have any questions? I'm just going to let that first. Lot, I want some questions. Um, you kind of get the theory, probably? Yeah, a I get bit. it. If you think of it as a tank, that's going to make you know more sense. What would a bad upstream look like? Uh, it would probably be flatline. Flatline? I mean, it could be down here. It could be another way, if, it, if it's really, really slow to respond, um, and the way to check that kind of would be, like if it's like this, and then it goes like this, and then it goes like this, and then it goes like this, it's like really slow, and then it goes, because your fuel trims, the whole time, let's say, I put the fuel trim back up here, the whole time this is down, it's trying to add fuel, add fuel, add fuel, add fuel, add fuel. If it, had, if it takes a long time for it to add fuel, let's say this is, 6% from here to here is 6%. Mm -hmm. If it has to change it 6% for it to see the difference, morning Wesley. If it has to change it 6% to see the difference, that's like, I would like to see 3% change in the short term to be able to run. If it has to change it 6%, it had to force that rich, 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 rich. Then all of a sudden it's seen rich, so it had to go, it'll start taking it away. Mm -hmm. And then as soon as it gets, as soon as it crosses 450 right here, it'll start adding it again, but it takes a long time to do it. So instead of the short one we had up there, it's a long one. That would be a bad, a 
bad upstream or two times. What would that indicate the problem would be then if you have a bad upstream? Well, it might not be hot enough, but you're probably going to have a code. If you got that, if it looks like that, you're going to have a code pretty much anything new. Some people dodge them, they're tricky. They're stupid. <laughs> Any other questions? Before I go on to how to test it. Oh. Yeah, what would happen if the sensor's bad, so you, how would you check the sensor, I guess would be my question. Oh, you check the sensor? Mm -hmm. um, this stuff right here makes great sensor testers. Spray the intake. That thing should go rich. Cool. Morning, Wesley. Morning. As soon as you spray out the intake, that thing should go up like this. Stay there, because you got tons of extra fuel in there. Okay. Um, and then since you sprayed it in there and gave it extra fuel, uh, it's trying to, it sees this and it's, it's trying to here. Let me just erase these really quick. gave it a whole bunch of extra fuel it didn't count for. It's called alternate fuel. Give it some alternate fuel, see if it responds. If it does, it responds. As soon as it crosses the 450 mark, this is gonna go from zero to negative and positive. So this is gonna go from zero, this is short term fuel term. Right there, it's gonna start going negative to try to bring that down. It's still got too much fuel. It's getting more fuel than it needs, than it's supposed to have. So it keeps going down. And eventually, you just shot, gave it a shot here. It's a small shot, so that shot runs out. And then it's already taking fuel away. So what's going to happen when that shot runs out? It's taking fuel away. It's going to go up. Well, what's the O2 sensor going to do, though? What's it going to report down here in this, in this exhaust pipe? Is it going to report rich or lean? Mm, one more. The alternate fuel runs out, so it's going to stop being rich. But this is already taking fuel away to try to get it from being rich. So it's going to be extra lean. So it's going to go down here, and it's going to stay down here. And then as soon as it crosses 450, this guy's going to try to go up, up, up. And then once it gets to about there, it's going to go up. And it'll do this because you don't, you're not messing with the fuel. It just does the same thing, basically inverse. And it changes right here at 450 every time. Uh, two cents. So that you force that grit, you force that lean. You screwed with it. Also, if you have an intake leak and it's got negative fuel or a positive fuel terms of positive 20, and it's running up here positive 20, because it's having to add fuel to the base calculation. If you spray it, the intake down with alternate fuel, you'll get it to peak. You know, do the same thing. You know, you got an intake leak. Because it's getting fuel and it shouldn't be getting any fuel except for the intake, like where it's sucking air from. Make sense? Did you know that, Katie? What, the intake leak thing? You can do that. Did you know you can, you can, make, you can hear it change, but did you know you can actually see it on the, if you watch the two sensors and the yeah, fuel Yeah, somebody told me that a while ago. They said that um, you can't always hear it, so you should probably watch that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's see. Okay, that's the downstream.
and stays high for a little bit. So you go. Let's say uh, I was doing a little bit of stuff here. This is kind of what they would look like. Right here is your brake clean. You hit it right there, and this went high. So this is going to take a little bit to get high. And then right here, the brake clean runs out and it goes low. And this stays high. If it's good, it'll stay high for about two extra seconds and then it'll kind of do that number. This, so this went low right here, and it went same place as right here. So this, see how this went low? Because it, uh, it didn't have any oxygen there. So for it to actually start spitting oxygen out the back, it took about two seconds. Does that make sense? The time, because this is a timeline. This is basically a timeline. So as it goes, and I should put these underneath each other to make a little more sense, but um, it got rich right here. This was stayed rich because it's upstream. And this is the fuel, this is the tank of air, or the tank making it not go exactly. It goes right here, right here we took fuel, or this dropped the lean, and it took about two seconds, and then this decided to drop the lean. That, that difference there between there and there, this two seconds, is how much that oxygen, that's storage in the catalytic converter. That make sense? It takes two seconds to get through the catalytic converter? Yep. Isn't that really, really slow? That's where we want. The longer that is, the better that converter is. So, Does that make sense? With the converter also has the job of like pretty much cleaning the exhaust. Being like it wet. cleans the extra hydrocarbons out. It doesn't actually filter it. Morning, Andrew. It cleans the exhaust. It doesn't actually filter it. It just it burns the extra hydrocarbons. So let's say this was a bad converter. We was on the we didn't really know what we thought about this converter. Um, uh, same thing we got right here. Let's say this converter is bad. We take it goes completely lean right here. So it just drops off like a half a second later and goes like that. That converter is not storing oxygen. Grab yourself a chair. Here's one. Are you good one? Are you good? Yeah. Does that make sense? Um, if it's actually that bad, I would expect this here to be a little bit more like this. Uh, so I would expect it to be a little more like this. Or it would probably go up quicker too. You know what I'm saying? It'll, it'll follow that more, right? and then uh, it would look, if it's bad, if it's, if it's not very good, as those come by there, it's gonna almost like mirror it and if it's completely garbage it's going to be literally like this no that's a different spot it's going to go up here and go like just like that i mean it's going to look almost identical make sense so it reflects it if it's garbage it's not storing the oxygen so garbage reflects garbage this is this is good. This front's doing what it's supposed to do, but the back should look more like that. So when you got the lambda sensors, this really doesn't even move. It just kind of goes like this because it's looking at a wide range and it can keep it right in the middle. So you kind of have to improvise on a lambda sensor. You almost have to use alternate fuel on a, on a lambda. I mean, there's a way I do it on the road because if you if you go on a car really hard, it's called WOT enrichment, wide open throttle enrichment, it'll actually throw more fuel to it. And then if you let off the car, especially if anybody has a Honda, if you let off, if you put a Honda, let's say you're going 50 and you put it in three, so it's like, ee, if you let off the gas, it goes, ee, do. you ever notice that? That is uh, D, D cell fuel cut. But you can use that to your advantage when you're diagnosing something because when it's in D-cell fuel cut, what should these O2 sensors read? There's no fuel going through injectors. 
zero. Zero. So you can use that to your advantage. You can do that right on the road test and force that instantly lean. And as soon as you as soon as you touch your foot on the gas, it's gonna shoot up again. And as soon as that shoots up, you can just watch the one behind it and see if it shoots up right away too. If it doesn't, if it takes a second or so. Some some catalytic converters are phenomenal. And it will take like it's just like a really, really flat thing. When you do all the stuff up here, it just it just smooths it out perfectly. Um, and some of them are like decel, both of them drop lean about right away, and then you touch it and one of them goes and they both spike up and go right back down. You know that thing ain't sore. But you do have to have a cat hot. I'm not sure how they have to, have to be, probably like 1200 degrees. So you can't just start up that truck right now and go out the lane and down the road and then do this test. So to do that, you want to go around the whole block and do it after you went around the block or go in long road test. Because um, that has to get hot. Until that thing's red hot and glowing, it's not gonna store and burn those oxygen. So the hydrocarbons come in here, this is cold. Hydrocarbons come out, stop out the backside, and what's it see? It sees the same thing in front of us, because it's not hot. It can't burn, right? Make sense? Mm -hmm. um, glow plugs for each cat. There's a lot of things they do to try to light that quickly. So on my truck, on the terrains, on everything that has the GDI, they fire the injector on the exhaust stroke. While it's pushing it out, they shoot injector fuel in there. <laughs> you know why? It lights that cat quicker. It's that cat up. <laughs> it's stupid. They will do anything they can to get the, the stuff uh, up to temperature in in good emissions as quickly as possible. Uh, you guys have any questions about that? Yay, nay. I bought plenty for everybody. Thank you. Yeah. Do you guys have any questions for that? I need lots of questions. You guys think of stuff I don't even think about talking about. Can I have one? Oh, do you want one? Thanks. Hey, sorry, sir. It's not like you bought them or anything. I know, right? <laughs> I purposely didn't eat my other bar, so I can have one of these, man. Any other questions? Uh, um, no, you explained it pretty well. Is there any other ways they try to light it quicker, or is that one of the main ones? Because that fascinates me. You just have to know that it doesn't light instantly. Um, so I would, if you want to light it quicker, I would probably take it around the block in second to third gear, about 4,000 RPMs. Just drive it at 4,000 RPMs. Whee! That'll light stuff quicker, make stuff hotter. If you have, uh, after a misfire, it's a good idea to do that because It'll burn the plugs off. Spin the plugs up a little bit. I usually set the park and hold it down, and once you get it in the area that's red, that one will go faster. Mm -hmm. Okay. Nice. Do not do what Caden just said. Logical. Not going to break anything. <laughs> um, <laughs> not do what Caden So, question. What would that look like on a misfire, just because I'm curious? Mm. That upstream and downstream, what would that look like on this side? Well, that's pretty deep, but I'm not try it plan. Misfire causes from lack of fuel or lack of ignition, right? More lack of air. There's other things, but that's the typical ones. Okay, so let's say it was a lack of fuel. Lack of fuel is gonna be lean here and lean here, right? It, let, this goes back to smelling the oxygen. That's why I wanna make sure you guys knew it was an oxygen sensor. It senses oxygen. So it's gonna sense a lot of oxygen if it doesn't have fuel with it. So. And this gets a little complicated for my brain even, but I have to think about this for a second. <laughs> I might explain it, and explain it in verse, but I don't think I will. So, let's say this is ignition misfire. Uh, no, this is, this is no fuel. 
cylinder six, no fuel. Injector's unplugged, injector's bad, the wire's cut, whatever. It's not done with fuel in cylinder six. So if it smells a lot of oxygen, it's going to be down here at the bottom. It smells a lot of oxygen. The fuel trim's gonna try to adjust, but it's not probably gonna adjust it very quick. Let's just say it hasn't adjusted yet. It smells a lot of oxygen, stays down there. Since there's no fuel, so there's just oxygen coming in here, there's no fuel, the downstream will look the same way, down at the bottom. Okay, that makes sense? Nothing changed in here, there was no fuel to burn. So same amount of oxygen came in here, same amount went out. That makes sense? That's on no fuel, that's a bad injector or something. Okay? So let's put a spark up here. No spark. Cylinder 6 is misfire. Now we have oxygen in here. Same amount of oxygen. But it's got fuel with it. What happens right here when you put oxygen and fuel in a hot cap? What happens to the oxygen? It's going to get the What happens? Why? Because it's, why? it's getting overwhelmed with more fuel. Well, what happens right here chemically? And that hot burn, burn, yeah, burn, burns burns it. What happens when you burn that oxygen with the fuel and it ignites and burns? Where does, does the oxygen disappear? It transfers into it. disappears. I mean, it burns it up. Yeah. If you start a fire in here, the oxygen level goes down. So you're starting a fire in there, the oxygen level goes down. So let's say let's say you started this firing right here because. The, you started feathering into it, and all of a sudden you got. Duh, 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 duh. So let's say you were doing good here, and this was, uh, you know, in the middle here because it's let's say this converter is good, so we actually have a flat line. It starts missing right here. Now, if, if it's a if it's a no fuel misfire because of lack of fuel, the same amount of oxygen is going to come out of here. If it's a lack of spark, there's oxygen and fuel here, and it gets burnt here. This, I believe, where it's going to smell less oxygen, this here is going to go up and go to the top because it's burning that. It will actually go different if it's because of lack of spark. Does that make sense? So literally on a test drive, and you get it, let's say it's an ignition misfire, <coughs> you get it to where all of a sudden it misses. You can look at the upstream and downstream O2 sensor if you have a hot lit cap and you can decide whether it's a spark missing because of down spark or missing because of down fuel. You know how to do that, don't you? That was that blew my mind when I realized that. Uh, no, I didn't at least there's something I forget about it. You get going because you get going into this cap. And I'm kind of trying to recall my head, yeah, because the cat, you know, if the cat's not lit, of course, then you gotta Yeah, that won't work. It won't work. Same thing comes out that goes in. But right. if you're putting hydrocarbons in here and oxygen, it just measures the oxygen That's on the front string. It stays low. Hydrogen, carbons, and oxygen, they burn up here. There's no oxygen that goes high. Correct. That's why it's supposed to burn up all the oxygen. But if you've got fuel, they get burned. Yep. It's, it's, uh, That's a lack of spark. But if you have a lack of fuel, yep. same thing goes in, same thing comes out. Yep. So, <laughs> kind of cool. Especially, you can really see it if you have an ignition misfire and you just take it. Just hold it there. It goes yep. like that. Yep. It'll change. Or if it's lack of fuel, plug injector, you know, crappy. Oh. They'll both go down and stay down. Does that make sense? It's kind of crazy, but I learned that in class. I definitely didn't come out with that myself. But that's the reason it's important to realize an oxygen sensor is an oxygen sensor. It senses oxygen. Now, I'll give you one thing to that to be clear. You've know, you got an upstream O2 reading wrong or a downstream reading wrong. That will mess you up totally. I've yeah. been there before. The computer's yeah. trusting it. Yeah. And then being the O2, you know, they'll get bit sometimes, but it's a good way at least to know where to go. We're assuming that we have good up. Yeah, you know, I'm from the dealer with things they did all four oh two because they had they listened they did all four had gone bad. This they literally would. We, and I was like all four at once. Yep. Just, you know. We replaced I said, look, the sensor's forty bucks. Throw a sensor in and see if that one comes back. He threw one sensor in that one came, came back. back. You're like changed all four of them, everything worked perfect. Wow. That was a little mind blowing. Yeah, he was like pulling hair out like, dude, the sensor's forty bucks, throw it in, see what happens. I think he got all four bad and he was like, we did. That's crazy. <laughs> That's crazy. One car, all four sensors were bad. Right? Is it a Chrysler, really? No, it was, it was a Ford. Oh, Ford. Ford Taurus. Wow. Three, three O or a three 
eight hours. That makes sense. That's true. Anybody need any more questions about this? I answered mine perfectly. Okay, we got a lot of stuff that we can cover now. What time is it? 15 minutes yet? Okay. Um, all right, well, what do you want to show you next, guys? Hit me with it. There's a bunch of stuff over here. Uh -huh. I went over a bunch of it yesterday, but it's still on there. Mass air pressure. Map? Map, yeah. And blur collector. Okay, got an engine here. Got a little twirly bird up here for the fan. <laughs> you got an intake. That's a real high rise intake on it. We got a you know, fan up here with the throttle. Now um, we got a sensor right here. We've got a mushroom sensor. It's got one, two, three. Three wires going to it. Goes with five volts. Sig. Return. Ground. So when that thing's closed, this thing's sensing. Well, let's put a scan tool up here. So the map. Sensor is closed, and this is closed. The engine's running. We have like uh, 12 inches of vacuum, probably, and it's going to probably be down here at 0.75, probably. And then we're going to open the throttle. The signal, the five volts, and we talked about this yesterday. On the, this is the same as a throttle position sensor. Basically, it's a kind of a rheostat, three-wire rheostat. Signal come up, so if we go from 5 volts, it'll go up as this is open. Same thing will happen on scan tool. It'll show the, the voltage. You, this might be in voltage and it might be in um, inches of vacuum on the scan tool. It could be either one. Just have to make sure it works. Um, this opens, pressure drops because more air gets in, and the voltage is going to go up and then go down. Does that make sense? I guess I could try to draw a rheostat out here. Let's say there's a, this is a diaphragm. Comes up here to a little pivot point, goes out here to the, no, that's not gonna work. I can't draw a rheostat, it's just, you have to know what it does. Remember that thing I drew yesterday with uh, the level, or the, the uh, throttle position sensor? Same thing happens there. I guess what I'm kind of stuck on is what it, what's the purpose of it? Well, why why do we need a mass air compressor? You know, it'll help me understand that. Okay. That's what you need to know. Okay. Um, so let's we're gonna talk about compare comparator. Okay? It's a little dude right here. He's an executive. He actually is on top of a bunch of little guys. So let's say this guy here is looking at a uh, map. He's looking at a map. This guy here is looking at TPS. This guy here is map, TPS, and RPM. And then I'll put another guy over here too. He needs to do. Uh, we're going to do a GM. This guy here is looking at MAF. Mass air flow. And then this guy, remember GIGO? What's GIGO mean? Garbage in, garbage out. Garbage in, garbage out. Yeah. This guy here, this is a PCM. This guy here is running the fuel injectors. There's another guy in this here I forgot too. I can't let him out. And this here is O2 sensors. So what we want to do is get the scan tool to scan tool. Once you go on the guy 12, 15 miles, it's 
guy's job. Is to listen to all these minions underneath him. These comparators, they're all talking to this big guy that makes the executive decision. Exec. Executive. And he's put he's making a decision on how much fuel is up in this car. He's also making a decision on how much time you There's a whole bunch of inputs, and he makes decisions to put the outputs out. So timing, so we need uh, it may, a lot of these actually affect timing. So RPM is basically crank, CKB, CMB, cam position. Okay, so this guy's looking at a map, and he's telling the big guy, the executive, I have 12 inches of mag, 12 inches of manifold pressure. This guy says, I am at point four five volts on the throttle position sensor. I'm at 800 RPMs. And my mass air flow is four grams a second. Four grams a second. That car's idle. Good morning. Good morning, y'all. That car's idle. He knows that I got a lot of vacuum. I'm, I have close throttle, low RPM, and um, four grams a second. It's idling. You can look at those numbers and you know that car's idling. All these guys are telling him it's idling. He made an executive decision to fire the injectors at two milliseconds. Okay, make sense? Now I'm gonna run, you know, 12 degrees of time. He makes decisions, goes out, goes out. So, kind of bad question, Will. Yeah. Why does it, why do we measure, or why is it made to measure the pressure rather than measuring just where the throttle body position is? You have to look at multiple things, because if it just measured pressure, there's two ways to do this. That's why I put the mass air flow sensor up there. There's two systems. There's speed density. So is that one called mass air flow? Speed density system and mass air flow system? So are they the same? No, is that the other? There's two okay. systems that you can run a car off of, right? Oh, and the map. There's a speed density system and mass air flow system, I think. And uh, manifold absolute pressure? Yeah, it still looks at those. So the speed density system uses Manifold pressure, SD, put that up here. Speed density uses manifold pressure, TP, TPS, and RPM. You can run a GM car on that right there. You can unhook the mass airflow. Literally, if you unhook the mass airflow on my truck right there, right now it looks at mass airflow and its main decision maker, this guy here has a bigger head talk has a louder voice up to that guy he literally does and that's how it works he's the main guy but if you unplug that and it sets a you know, 101 mass airflow below threshold if it sets that code it ignores this guy completely then it runs on the speed density system where it uses map TPS RPM I can make an educated decision and then I can look at my fuel O2 sensors and decide if that's right or not. And it's cell blocks. It, it fills each cell in. With, this, with these three criteria, I need that much fuel. With these three criteria up here, I need that much fuel. It's literally a cell block. What if you unplug the map? If you unplug the map, you're, getting, you're, you're cutting down its options a lot. But it'll still run off the TPS and, and RPM. No, but I'm saying what if you plug back your mass airflow and you just unplug the map, then it'll just run off the map? Yeah, then it would be more accurate probably. But if this here is lying, if it gets a little wires get all nasty and stuff, this will affect all kinds of stuff. Uh, remember I said the other day about the FM, uh, failure effects management system? I don't know how to do it. FMEM? You're a Ford guy. What's what's the failure effects management system? What's that called? FM? Yeah, sure. If you have something that's cut off, uh, like an injector, it'll make up a value of what in there? What's that called? Oh, it's failure I'm effects. Sure. Yeah, I'm not sure what the name is, it. but it has kind of a default value that it'll run on. Failure effects management, that's what I'm gonna call it. So if you, if you take this guy away, the failure effects management will 
it doesn't even need that because it has basically two systems on it. Um, but if you took the map sensor away, it might put something in there, or it will. Or it'll probably put something in there. But it'll just look at these here and say, okay, I'm good, I can still run. Morning, Sam. What you're saying is the weight reduction. Take that your map and your map here. It's more accurate and it has all the data. So, remember I was talking about long term and short term fuel term? And how the oxygen sensor is driving the oxygen sensor? So, this executive puts fuel in at 2 milliseconds. That comes down here. And the effect of the fuel injector is that the O2 sensor changes based on how much fuel it gives. So, that, that this little comparator right here talks to this guy and says, hey, I got too much. Take it away. So it goes 1.9. Comes down here. Hey, it's too little. 1.95. Comes down here. Too much. That's that. It's, a, it's literally called a closed loop system. It's, it's closed loop. Once it's reading the oxygen sensor and taking the information in and making decisions off it, it's literally closed loop. Keeps doing that. Keeps doing that all the time. All the time you're driving down the road. Does that make sense? Because this closed loop right here on a scan tool looks like, uh, you know, ST, FT, and uh, B1, S1, bank one, sensor one. So it goes up, this guy goes down a little bit, this goes down, this guy goes up, just like that. Make sense? This is this is this guy making a decision for short, short term. Then he's looking at this here, the mass airflow sensor, with this comparator, and it's saying, "I need more. I need less. I need more. I need less. I need more. I need less." He just sits there and goes back and forth on the lever. Does that make sense? I'm sure you guys have a lot of questions. So what do you got? That's a lot to take in. What if all this is like this? So where are you getting that number from? 
That's, that's what? Sure. Well, 20 milliseconds, how do you know? What? It'll be right here. It'll be in scan tool. Uh, B1 injector MS. As you hit that throttle, it'll go, and then you let off and it'll go like that. Go back to two. How do you know 20 is like the max? How do you know it couldn't be like 400? Well, 400, 400 milliseconds. Do you think that that injector is going to need to fire before a, a half a second? It's not firing once every half a second. So it's going to be like, did, 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 and that's a lot less than a half a second. So it's going to be on all the time. So it can't be 400. Literally in race stuff, when they have to put more fuel to it, they run out of on time, and so they have to put a bigger injector so it gets quicker so they can back the on time on. Does that make sense? That's what they do when they turbo Hondas. Um, yeah. So let's say all this is happening, and all of a sudden this mass air, map sensor says, I'm at 12 inches of vacuum still. You think these guys, this guy can figure out that that guy's lying? Yeah. This is an idle number. Closed throttle. If I got wide open throttle, a lot of RPM, a lot of grams a second, I know that that guy's lying. This guy knows that guy's lying, so he just covers it up. He sets a, I don't know, I don't even know what a map is for. What's a, what's a map code? Do you know what map code would be? Okay. Not right off my head. Is it like a 600 code or a... I don't know, it doesn't matter. He sets a map code, ignores that guy, and keeps on running. Or, let's say a 3800 car. If you have a, a mass airflow sensor that keeps dropping out, it'll make it stumble and stall, because it happens instantly, it's still looking at it, it hasn't set a code and ignored it yet. You can have those, uh, sometimes you tap on with a screwdriver, you flip them with your hand, and they go, duh, 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 duh. Because it's changing the milliseconds and it's taking fuel away for a second here because it's dead. Make sense? What other questions you got? Hit me up. It's the easiest to find a sensor that's dead. When they're lying, it sucks. O2 sensors are lying, it kind of sucks. But you can you can compare upstream and downstream. If one of them's always high and the other one's always low, you know one of them's lying. Because they're made in the same stream. Assuming you don't have a misfire. But you could have a misfire problem that way. What is I for some reason for life and I can't remember what PCM stands for. PCM? Yeah. Powertrain control line. Okay, yeah. PCM, PCM. Powertrain probably has a trans controller in it. They call them that. Oh, okay. ECM, engine control monitor. You think of it that way, so it's like, you know, right? Okay, that'd be fine. I'm just thinking, I don't remember. Um, what else you got? What would those numbers look like that idle? I have those up here first. 12 inches of vacuum, a quarter of a volt, because it's closed. The idle's at 800, it'd be 800. And the idling mass airflow grams a second on like my truck would probably be like four, four grams. We're at 170. So we're on it, high RPM, high load. Does that make sense? That's really cool. That's out here. So this also changes timing too. So if it's a high RPM, high load, uh, well, medium load is about it can change the timing. If you're just like cruise and you get on it a little bit, you can timing can go up to like 40 degrees. Um, BTDC. Does anybody know what that means? Yep. Before the pistons all at the top, it'll, it'll fire 40 degrees before. You know why that is? Because it takes time for fuel to light. So when it's the top, it goes boom. If you run too much timing, the fire is over here, it goes boom right here, and then it has to compress that as it's exploding, it has to continue to compress it and then come back down again. Make sense? I've executed it. Could you, so you're saying it lights and there's more fuel in there then? No. It just lights it before it gets to the top. Yeah, you can get the, like, the ping in and crazy stuff back in. Yep, uh, what do they call that? It's, uh, 
spark knot or uh, this is a detonation. Uh, it detonates. If you have a piece of carbon in there that stays like a glow engine, a little nitro glow engine, it'll ignite wherever it wants to. And it still has, after it ignites, it's still coming around. It's gonna go up, and then it goes down and makes a bad noise. It's really, really hard. You can blow uh, engine bearings and all kinds of bad stuff. We had a charger one time where somebody put a tuner on it, had a Hemi in it, put a somebody had a tuner on it, we, it blew out one of the rod bearings. So we changed the crank, changed the rod, put it back together, they sold it to somebody else, it went and blew out a rod bearing. And it was because of the tune, I think. Well, yeah, it changed the timing, run too much timing and it screws up. Uh, anybody else have any questions? No. You guys all understand how all the fuel injection systems work and everything? Yeah. No, but I, it's a good place to start. I, I never really thought that they're all plugged in in one central place. They are. And these guys each have a say. It's like a vote. These guys are all devote, voting that I'm a wide open throttle, and this guy right here says I'm an idol. This guy knows that if everybody else is telling me I'm wide open, He's lying. So I might ignore him. These guys take the vote. We put the, we dump 20 milliseconds and that confirms it right here. And it goes back up to 02 cents and it says, yep, you're right. Dude, if you get multiple things lying, it really sucks to diagnose stuff. <laughs> I was just gonna ask the kids. It, it does. Star, yeah. If you had uh, you could have I mean you could have no fuel pressure, that would make you know make it the O2 sensor, you know, not let's say you had half the fuel pressure needed. Well, it has to double the milliseconds to get the same amount of fuel in, so it's going to make the fuel trims go way positive to get it in there. And then it's going to be like, something's not right here. It's going to go positive until it can't go positive anymore. And then at that point, morning, Mike. At that point, it's going to set a code. Usually that's uh, plus 20. Okay, here's a question for you. You got half fuel pressure you're supposed to, yet you're still getting, and you're getting hardly any fuel, but you're still getting ship fuel mileage. Get what? Like terrible fuel mileage. Okay, and you have what fuel pressure? Half fuel pressure yeah, should be. You're talking about diesel engine. Yeah. I don't care about diesel. Don't do me like that. Well, are we talking about diesels? 